Bitcoiners, welcome back to another episode of FedWatch. I'm here with Ansel and regular guest Dylan LeClaire. Dylan is our head of market intelligence and research over at Bitcoin Magazine. He heads up the Deep Dive newsletter and every single month we sit down with him to go over his Deep Dive monthly review. Uh, so uh, today is the first week of November uh, and uh, we're going to be reviewing everything that's happening in the grand scheme of things when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, we also are going to hit on some really pertinent Fed news around tightening and QE. Uh, so got a really go good show lined up for y'all. Um, Dylan, welcome back to the show. Thanks again for having me, guys. I'm excited to dig in here and uh, talk some Bitcoin and uh, central banks. So yeah, always, always excited to talk to you about what's happening in macro. Um, but we have some pretty big personal news for you as well. Um, I know that uh, beyond just working at uh, Bitcoin Magazine, you've expanded your role over at BTC Inc. Yeah, so I uh, just announced about 30 minutes ago on Twitter, uh, joining the UTXO team. So uh, they're a fund that kind of attempts to generate alpha on top of Bitcoin by by navigating the kind of the boom and bust cycles. Um, and so this traditionally was kind of the having cycle, but uh, Bitcoin just, you know, trades cyclically, trades reflexively. So um, you know, I'm joining joining the team as a senior market analyst to uh, you know attempt to bring some intelligence and uh, you know analysis to to what they're doing over there. Yeah, no, I'm super excited for you uh, with that. Uh, you and Sam have been doing really incredible work at Bitcoin Magazine, and I think there's just a lot of symmetries with our fund. Uh, and for everyone out there who's listening, Bitcoin Magazine is part of the BTC Inc. family. So that's the Bitcoin Conference, that's UTXO, that's Earn Carrot, and obviously Bitcoin Magazine. So uh, we are, in my opinion, the ultimate Bitcoin company and really lucky to have uh, Dylan on the team and Ansel as part of that family. Uh, so again, congrats, Dylan. And let's get into uh, this week's agenda. Ansel, some big news from the Fed. Yeah. Um, before I jump into the Fed, I just want to plug the Kansas City event. It's a Bitcoin Day event in Kansas City this weekend. So if you guys are anywhere near Kansas City, and want to uh, venture out and meet some people, hear some people talk about Bitcoin in person, uh, check out Bitcoin Day Omaha. Okay, let's, sorry, bitcoinday.io. All right, let's uh, jump into the Fed talk. Now, they're meeting today and tomorrow, and we all expect a taper decision. Um, we don't know if, well, it's almost guaranteed that they will be tapering, uh, but or starting to taper, but we don't know if it's November or December. If it's going to be 15 billion a month, um, you know, less each month, or maybe 20 or 10, we're not sure on the exact number. Um, but some of the interesting things that I've pulled up uh, over the last week is there is a lot of disagreement among central banks. So the Fed is talking about taper. The ECB uh, is talking about holding steady. The BOJ is also holding steady. They pretty much have no taper anywhere in the foreseeable future. And the PBOC is increasing their stimulus. You know, they're having all the trouble with Evergrande and the contagion and the real estate market there. So they are going the opposite way as the Fed. Now, when you look at the smaller emerging markets or even some of the other smaller G7 countries like Canada and the UK, they, um, they are going to be curtailing their QE and possibly even raising rates. So Canada has already curtailed or already ended their QE. And the UK is talking about uh, pulling back on their QE or tapering as well. So um, I don't know, there's disagreement among the central banks. And before I get into some of the warning signs, do you guys have any comments on uh, the taper or what we see kind of disagreement among the central banks? I think it's pretty interesting that, um, you know, taper has now turned into just reducing the scale of QE where they're still, you know, they're still talking about expanding the balance sheet just for, you know, reducing the, the acceleration of, of the balance sheet expansion. Um, and I think in terms of the Fed, I think there's, you know, they're, they're in a tough spot. Well, really every central bank because of the supply chain issues, because of, you know, now it's not just asset inflation, but the consumers are starting to feel this with, with the stuff that the CPI measures, the PCE, whether it's food, energy, um, you know, just going to the grocery store is a lot more expensive. A lot of this stuff isn't even measured with shrinkflation. Uh, so, you know, they're in a tough spot where they're, you know, the asset asset inflation and all the debt dynamics that that have you, Ansel, as a deflationist, um, you know, this coming up against, 
this massive uh, inflationary event. And so they're, you know, they're kind of stuck uh, in, a, in a hard spot here. Uh, and I, I mean, I know I wouldn't want to be a central banker because, you know, it's really kind of a lose-lose situation. Yeah, I think Powell really wishes he had some support from the Congress, you know, on the fiscal side. But it seems like there is more gridlock than ever. They barely were able to push the debt ceiling back once again. Is it even a ceiling if you just keep pushing it back? Uh, but um, yeah, I, what do you think about Congress? And is he going to get any help on that side? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think it's just a game of chicken where, um, you know, regardless of what Congress does or Powell or any of any uh, kind of central bank governor, especially in, in the U.S., uh, just with the, the U.S. being the world reserve currency, uh, the dollar really can't spike for a sustained period of time without just destroying the global economy. So if it comes with this taper or, it's, you know, kicked, it's kicked, you know, down the road a little bit, it's, you know, some sort of deleveraging, some sort of liquidity event is inevitable uh, at some point, just with the, with the dollar against other fiats, because um, essentially it's kind of like almost a race to the bottom, uh, the incentives of fiat currency and how the global economic system is shaped. And so uh, I think the U.S., uh, you know, they, they, they're going to have to continue to kind of debase the dollar uh, relative to, to these other currencies, because if not, there's going to be kind of this, this global dollar squeeze where every asset sells off, the global economy tanks. Um, and, you know, it's really just, it's not even up, up for decision or debate. It's just a matter of, you know, how hard can they jawbone and, and walk the line until that event happens. Yeah, I hear you. I have some more uh, charts here to maybe talk about warning signs. So I'm going to jump in. All right. So over here, the Treasury yield curve uh, today, you can see this the 20 year and the 30 year is inverted. And uh, also the one month and the three month are inverted. So uh, there's two inversions in the curve right now. And this this curve seems pretty steep, right? But that's because it only goes up to 2.25%. Uh, instead of like a realistic five or 10%. Uh, if it was, you know, if the y-axis was extended where a normal rate would be, this would be very, very flat. But uh, I just wanted to point out that it, there is an inversion at the long end of the curve. Also the five-year rate, um, there is a pretty big uh, inversion here between the five-year break-even and the 10-year break-even. And I actually charted it out to show the difference. And it is the biggest inversion in the history of these break-even uh, tips. So that's pretty significant if you ask me. That's a pretty big inversion between the five-year and the 10-year. Um, any comment on that, guys? Yeah, well, so I would love to hear both Dylan as well as Ansel kind of explain why these inversions are so important and like why that's a, a big deal. Um, just because I, for one, I, I don't even know, you know, what I'm looking at. Angela, you want to give that one a go? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the inversions kind of matter because, um, well, traditionally, okay, so the two-year and the 10-year, um, you know, a traditional uh, interest rate curve is going to be upward sloping because the banks, they borrow short and they lend long. So they have to have some way to make money. So they borrow at a lower interest rate and they lend at a higher interest rate. Um, during periods or right before almost every recession since World War II, um, you see an inversion of that rate. And that is where people are uh, you know, more scared about near-term chaos. And so they, uh, the yield curve inverts. People rush towards safety. Um, I had... I guess that kind of explains it a little bit. Dylan, do you, do you have any more to add to that? Yeah, I just, I guess it's just uh, the yield curve inverts because it's, it's kind of foreshadowing a, a liquidity crunch or a credit contraction, um, which, which is what you kind of described. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not the, the foremost expert on, on the bond market, but uh, yeah, I think it has been kind of a leading recession indicator ever since we've uh, you know, had a developed treasury market. So I think that's you know, important to, to point out. Excellent. Okay. I had a couple more things here on warning signs. Um, the reverse repo. So remember the reverse repo is up at uh, 1.4 trillion every night. And if the Fed is going to be curtailing uh, asset purchases, perhaps there will be less 
quantity or less uh, reverse repo and more cash in the system anyway, because, okay, so the way it works with quantitative easing, right, is that the Fed is taking securities off the market and the reverse repo is just the opposite. Banks are giving dollars or lending dollars to get those securities back onto the market. So if they are going to be lessening QE, what is going to be the effect on the reverse repo? It might like be a wash anyway, even if it was some sort of fundamental, um, it might be a wash anyway. Any thoughts on yeah. that? I kind of think of uh, the reverse repo as it's a way to keep the front end of the treasury curve nominally positive um, because they're, they're doing so much, they're doing so much asset purchases that they're, they're taking all this collateral out of the financial system and banks, uh, you know, the Fed can't print money. They can only print bank reserves. So um, the banks banks have a bunch of reserves and almost no collateral. Um, so these front end, uh, basically, like the reverse repo says, you can uh, get five basis points on your on your reserves uh, with the Fed. And so you see, basically, if you look at the the you know the short end of the Treasury curve, um, I don't even what is it one month three month, um, just like the short term the shortest term securities. Uh, those have been basically locked at five basis points. Uh, and one of them actually flashed uh, nominally negative just briefly, I think, earlier in the summer. And so I kind of view it as just a way they're just kind of pinning that front end of the curve nominally positive, even though in real terms, it's obviously with the CPI at five or six percent or whatever inflation you know measure you want to use, they're, they're far negative. Excellent. And then I just had uh, one more thing with... Um... <laughs> coming up on this taper decision from Powell is that uh, predict it still has him at 67% odds over Lael Brainerd to stay chairman of the Fed. So he's still popular. I don't know if they're going to pin some sort of, you know, if he does do this taper now and we have some sort of double dip recession, uh, if they're going to try to pin it on him to get Lael Brainerd in. I mean, these are all uh, kind of total speculation and total, um, you know, what uh, game planning out the future. But uh, I right now, Powell is sitting a pretty heavy favorite. Where is that in terms of uh, historically uh, where Powell is stacked up? Because my memory serves me, uh, you know, he was like a 90%, you know, not even that long ago. So it does seem as though uh, he's losing some sort of favorability. Am I incorrect with that? Sorry, I'm just going back on predict it right now. The, the farthest back they have is 90 days. And uh, he's been in the 70s all the way back uh, since August. So he's roughly the same, maybe slightly lower. Fair enough. Dylan, what do you think of like Powell being made into a scapegoat and people move and, you know, I guess politically uh, there's a move to bring in someone who's more of a like uh, ECB style, uh, more I guess, like loose with monetary policy type of a chairman. Yeah, I I mean, I don't have too much insight onto who they would bring or or what I, I think it's just a credibility thing, honestly. Um, I think regardless of, of who it is, um, they just, you know, they need someone to go up there with a bold face and say everything's going to be okay and say and act like they have it under control. Um, and so if that's Powell, then it's Powell. And if, if Powell loses credibility because the markets tank or, or, you know, because, uh, you know, the S and P is pumping and, and inflation's ripping and they won't raise rates, whatever it is, it can, you know, it's kind of both sides of the spectrum. Uh, I think they're going to want to bring in someone that has uh, credibility. And if that's Powell, that's Powell. And I think a lot of the, the ethics concerns and stuff with fed governors that happened over the last couple of months is really convenient. Um, you know, these guys are riding off into the sunset. Um, <laughs> And so I, I, I don't really have too much uh, to offer there, but uh, I think they definitely want to bring in someone with credibility. That's fair enough. And again, one of the big theses on this show is that, you know, the Fed doesn't actually have that much power. And a lot of it is just, you know, impression and expectation management. 100% agree. Ansel, do we want to talk about anything else or uh, should we jump into uh, the October report? Yeah, that's all I had for the Fed news items. I will link in the show notes a bunch of different stuff for people. And if you don't see those where you listen to the show, you can always go to Bitcoin Magazine and find the post for the episode and there'll be all the links there. Yep. Uh, Dylan, you want to share your screen and start hitting on, uh, on some of these metrics and some of the macro things that are happening both you know, on-chain and 
uh, in the in the world at large? All right, so um, right here I have the, it's the long-term holder kind of this is supply shock ratio. So basically it takes in uh, long-term holders, short-term holders, um, and you know, there's only, there's only two buckets. Uh, the threshold for this is 155 days, but the coin becomes more weighted the longer it's held because statistically the longer a, a UTXO is held, the less likely it's, it's gonna be spent. And so that 155 day threshold seems quite arbitrary, but there's like a pretty, uh, pretty good statistical back test there. Uh, regardless, uh, it gives some pretty good insight into what uh, the kind of the market sentiment is. And when you see uh, this this uh, long term holder ratio uh, reach these kind of heightened levels, what it means is that uh, the the long term holders are controlling a, a large part of the free float. So we kind of call this a supply squeeze because essentially uh, that that free float of available Bitcoin is is very very small proportionate to the circulating supply. Uh, and so we, you know, we have these circles of the past times it's happened over the last, uh, you know, eight years or so, um, and and really kind of it's almost like a, a bear market bottom. Besides the besides that, you know, blip right before COVID, which was uh, you know kind of a macroeconomic event outside of of Bitcoin. Um, but you know, basically right before these parabolic bull runs, we see long term holders take up a huge uh, kind of proportion of the of the circulating supply and. You know, we're right there despite being at, you know, flirting with all time highs. So uh, from an on chain perspective, the supply dynamics are, are very bullish. Um, can I also. I have a question on that real quick, if I can, is um, the is that that's not dollar value. That is just Bitcoin versus circulating Bitcoin. Correct. Yeah. So right now uh, it's this ratio is at four point four five. So there's. Uh, long-term holders hold 4.45 Bitcoin for every one Bitcoin that short-term holders hold. Um, and so it just kind of, it, and, and when a long-term holder, when a, a coin is moved that was classified as long-term holders, it, it moves to the short-term holder bucket. So, um, you know, there is kind of a, a dynamic there in bull markets where you see uh, as the price runs up, old holders just move a proportion of their coins. Um, and and is every as every time uh, Bitcoin is transferred uh, on chain, is that an economic sell? No. Um, so these, I mean, it is not a perfect measure, but uh, you know, in general, when you see these, you know, uh, coins that have that have been held for five years, three years, uh, just for long periods of time, uh, move. It's especially you know all at once, or you know, uh, more frequently as as price runs up. Uh, there's kind of this this dynamic that occurs that uh, you know the market kind of hits the top. There's just Right now, there's an imbalance between uh, available supply and new money that's going to come in, and eventually that flip will, will, you know, it'll kind of, it'll flip. That script will uh, reverse, and we'll see, you know, some sort of parabolic top just based on how Bitcoin trades, or at least that's an assumption. Uh, maybe we don't, and it just grinds up higher forever. But uh, just with the way that Bitcoin has traded in the past, that's what we've seen. Dylan, is this the highest this ratio has ever been? Uh, I'm, I'm just eyeballing this chart right now. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Off the top of my head, it might have reached a higher peak during the early days when Bitcoin didn't even have a, a market uh, price. Um, but yeah, um, long-term holder supply is at an all-time high. Um, this ratio, if you look at it right in the, the corner there, it, it has it has peaked just a little bit as long-term holder supply is stagnated and as circulating supply has has increased. So uh, the ratio has peaked, but long-term holder supply is is right at that all-time high, uh, despite you know basically uh, being in somewhat of a of a bull market. We're seeing like a the bear market accumulation dynamic. We we highlighted that all summer, uh, saying hey like this is this is the price action you see during a sustained bull market as we're as we're chugging back up to this April high and, and we passed it and we're we're not seeing any of that profit taking yet, which is a really encouraging sign for bulls. Would you expect this to get higher over time? You know as Bitcoin gets used more as a medium of exchange um, and people store value that there would be less percent on like retail trading platforms. Yeah, so um, I think it's it's interesting to think about in the sense that um, there's, you know, increasingly like uh, some some of the, you know, economic volume that occurs on Bitcoin, uh, you know, it eventually will settle on chain as everything does, you know, for that finality. Um, and like the settlement assurance, but a lot of the stuff happens off chain, right? Where, you know, if I have a lightning channel per se, right? And lightning's still really small. It's like 3000 Bitcoin. So almost nothing in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, increasingly there'll be, you know, third-party apps where I can send money on cash app or something. 
Um, but again, like that's still really, really small. Uh, and the vast, you know, vast majority of, of Bitcoin, uh, you know, economic transfers and, and sells and is, is occurring on chain. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about uh, over time, it, it may, you know, shift more and more off chain or more Bitcoin may be used as a medium of exchange uh, and long-term holders as a proportion of the supply uh, after the monetization event may be a lot less. It's interesting. I haven't, I haven't really thought about that too deeply, but uh, you definitely bring up a good point. Yo, what is going on, plebs? We're going to take a break from our programming to tell you about the resurrection of our print magazine, starting with the El Salvador issue. Starting this fall, Bitcoin Magazine will be available on newsstands nationwide and at retail stores such as Barnes & Noble. Don't want to get off your couch, though? No problem. You can also go to store.bitcoinmagazine.com. So skip the line and get each issue shipped directly to your front door with our annual subscription. I'm talking four issues a year that contain exclusive interviews and profiles with leading Bitcoiners, actionable insights on the state of the market, breaking news and cultural trends, along with powerful photos and artwork from the best artists in the world. Subscribe today and get 21% off using code podcast at checkout. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, podcast at checkout. I think this is an interesting one as well. Um, so here we have, uh, so there's what's called coin days destroyed. So you can, so essentially if you hold one Bitcoin for 365 days for a year, you accumulate that coin, that UTXO accumulates 365 coin days. Um, so essentially a coin day destroyed is when after a coin is, is held for a long period of time, if you move that, then a coin day, or in the sense that if you held it for a year, then 365 coin days are destroyed. If you held one Bitcoin, if you held 10 Bitcoin for 365 days, you would destroy 3,650 coin days. And so you see, uh, during kind of bull market peaks, this is kind of a similar, uh, similar chart showing, you know, profit taking essentially, you know, Bitcoin is held. Uh, it runs up 10x, 20x, and long-term holders, uh, you know, stackers in the bear market will, uh, you know, take a little bit off the table. And you see a lot of, you know, coins come to the surface right at, and yeah, these blow-off top periods. Um, and so this is the history of of Bitcoin. And actually, funny enough, we're we're even we're nowhere near that point. Um, it's we're actually the lowest point uh, in this coin days destroyed metric. It's a 90 day rolling sum. So it takes the last 90 days of how many coin days were destroyed and, and adds them together. And we're at the lowest point in a decade. So what is what this is telling you is that no one's selling um, and, and, it, and it weights it by not only uh, coin uh, volume, just how many Bitcoin someone has, but how long it's been held. So it's really a, a pretty telling metric and it shows just how strong the accumulation has been. It, uh, if I could jump in, I feel like this chart and the last chart really do kind of prove Pete Rizzo's thesis a little bit that the top is this kind of period that forces long-term holders to sell. And it's whatever price a long-term holder, you know, is uncomfortable holding 100% of their stack and not selling. Um, and I feel like these metrics, you know, paint that beautifully. And if you look at October, like, if you think that the bull run has started or is done, like we're just at the beginning of, of the real hype, like the, you know, we're just cocking this bad boy, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing it back. Yeah. Essentially it's like a spring is just coiling up and like the, the actual, the mania phase of this, uh, uh like the reason that Bitcoin trades reflexively is you see, right. Like it hodlers, stackers, engineer supply squeeze. They, they, we, we're going to acquire up as much of this free float as possible. And this is like a kind of a gain theoretic standpoint of I'm going to do this at an individual level and a bunch of other people and institutions around the world are also going to do this. And eventually any new money that has to come in has to competitively bid up the price. Uh, and as that price, you know, bids up by a factor of two, 10, 20, a hundred even, uh, well, I might, you know, Bitcoin at, at the end of the day is just money. And so, so I'm going to, I'm going to move that money. And with on-chain analytics, we can see that, that movement. And so, yeah, we're, you know, I think we're in the early phases of, I wouldn't even say like, despite the price action, it's not even really the bull market yet in terms of what we're seeing from an on-chain perspective. It's, it's still the accumulation phase, which is, uh, quite exciting. <laughs> Uh, and then this one is just uh, balances on exchange. Um, you know, this isn't more, this isn't really a, a directional kind of metric like the other two, 
um, in the sense that we kind of have a limited data set. And if if this chart showed the entire uh, history of balances on exchanges, it it basically was in a secular uptrend until March of 2020. Uh, and since that point, uh, we've seen the exact opposite. Uh, and, and despite blips here and there uh, with this April and May, uh, with a lot of coins coming on exchanges, it's essentially just been this massive accumulation, uh, not your keys, not your coins, uh, is taking effect, and it, it looks it looks pretty good to me. And I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, March 2020 was this kind of macro top for balance on exchanges. I've I've seen this chart a lot, and I'm not a big fan of this one because uh, the dollar value on chain or on the exchanges is continuing to increase. You know, so it's really if you look at between March of 2020 and today, it's like 10x more value is on the exchanges so i i, I see where it is like in in comparison to the long-term holders and uh this type of these other type of metrics that this is uh important to like confirm those other things as well but uh overall i, I think that you know this is a, a not as informational a chart as the others yeah, of course. I, and I, I agree to an extent. I mean, it's a lot harder to uh, to bid up the price than it was in, in March or April of 2020. Um, but I think it just kind of shows the, a trend of of just uh, maybe not self-sovereign because a lot of these, uh, you know, maybe big institutions are using custodians and whatnot. But uh, it's just kind of a way to say, hey, you know, not all this Bitcoin is for sale either. There's a lot of people that are just holding Bitcoin on Coinbase, you know, and, and think that they are never going to sell. But it's kind of a, a measure of you know, what Bitcoin could be sold at the moment. And I think the lower this goes, uh, the better, in my opinion. You, and you'll probably see yeah. at some sort of cycle top uh, or, you know, local top, uh, we'll probably see that I would, I would imagine we see some sort of influx into exchanges. Um, but that's, that's just a hunch. Well, I was just going to say like, yeah, I feel like this chart is important. It's definitely not a chart that tells you anything about self-custody of funds, right? But I think it tells you something about intention to sell in like the most rudimentary way. Um, and it probably can definitely show like a flip, right? So when you flip uh, back to coins being added to an exchange, you know, that's probably a bearish sign. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think it, it is important. And in combination with these two other charts that call, show kind of long-term holder sentiment, I mean, it's it's super bullish. Also, you know, I kind of been pushing this idea of like people are, are really not bullish enough on the block reward and that in BTC terms, like we can afford for this stuff to go down in value or down in BTC terms, just because, you know, USD terms or buying power wise, it's just going to go parabolic. Uh, so I don't know if you want to like chime in on your thoughts there, but you know, 37 sats is pretty underrated in my opinion. <laughs> that was a, that was a funny tweet the other week. And I, I, I agree to an extent. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's designed, engineered to pump forever. Um, so I guess the biggest kind of derivatives futures uh, announcement uh, development in, in October was uh, the futures ETF approval. Um, and if we're, if we're looking at this chart, so this is the CME futures uh, one month annualized rolling basis. So what that means in uh, normal talk is uh, Bitcoin has a spot, a spot price. If you go on Coinbase or any exchange right now and look at the price, uh, but it also has a futures price. So there's a market for Bitcoin trading next month. Um, and so if you take the spread, the difference between the futures price next month and the price today, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, annualize that, uh, that difference over, over a 12 month period, you get the rolling basis. And so um, basically this, uh, this basis, you know, during the summer, August uh, and September and into October was kind of flirting with zero to five percent range there there wasn't much of a, a premium on the futures curve on the cme exchange uh and before the kind of etf approval or anything formal was announced uh just some rumors floating around uh this this basis really got bit up in a big big way um and the etf was approved on the the 19th officially or started trading on the 19th but uh it looked like so, there was some kind of smart smart money or maybe in the know traders uh, that that had some info, and so they they kind of front ran this this ETF approval, uh, and and made some made some good change along the way. Uh, uh, Dylan, do you see this as like a magnet for the price? Um, and can you explain this uh, like an arbitrage trade here? So if you go short futures and long spot, 
you talk about that in your deep dive. So, yeah, of course. So um, essentially, you know, Bitcoin has returned, uh, you know, 150% compounded annually for the last 10 years. But uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, but even just 15 or 20% returns uh, in a way that is, is uh, essentially risk free is, is, is also very, very good, especially in the legacy world where where yields are are zero percent, like we talked about in the in the first part of the podcast, the treasury yields for for thirty years is, is just two percent uh, in in nominal terms. So uh, with this Bitcoin futures curve, uh, you can go out in a, in a way that's completely market neutral, which doesn't leave you to the uh, exposed to the downside or upside of Bitcoin. You can collect these these pretty pretty big yields. So this is the the futures annualized rolling basis on on a three month period. Uh, for all Bitcoin exchanges, just kind of averaged out, and so we saw this this uh, annualized rolling basis or contango, uh, as is sometimes called. Uh, contango is when the futures is trading to a premium of spot. Uh, we saw this hit like 45% earlier in the year, and so um, essentially what was happening was there was a lot of speculators that were betting on the Bitcoin price to go up, and they were doing that by buying these these futures uh, contracts. Um, and so that premium rose to a, to a huge, huge level. Um, and, and in terms of it leading kind of the way, uh, I think it does. And it kind of it's it's cyclical with with bull and bears. We saw all that kind of leverage and speculation get wiped out in the middle of the summer, um, you know, where this premium almost basically touched zero. Uh, and so, you know, that's the, the sentiment is, re- is very strong with derivatives. Um, and I think there is some some sort of reflexivity there uh, as as traders buy buy uh, the futures. It encourages more people to come into spot, uh, and, and it kind of if it feeds on itself. But eventually, uh, if there isn't an underlying spot bid, if there isn't someone to come in uh, and buy the buy the spot and sell the futures, uh, then this then this kind of huge premium you'll you'll sometimes see uh, just has to unwind. And so that's what we saw in April, um, and I think we're pretty healthy right now. This chart has the the premium at, at about fourteen percent on a three month basis. Um, and so, I mean, I do think it, it, it's an incentive for capital to come into the Bitcoin market. And so I, in my opinion, it's a net benefit. When, uh, when Antel calls it a magnet, I feel like the layman's way of saying it is that like, you know, this trade is so enticing at times that it kind of forces anyone who's just looking for yield to like effectively, you know, take part in it. Um, and we saw this happen a lot with uh, GBTC and SPOT. But now, you know, we're seeing it with futures and some people like they think that this is going to be part of Bitcoin's pricing dynamic forever. Like what's like what's like the bigger trend here and like why, like, like how does this play into like Bitcoin's financialization? Yeah, my, my kind of thesis on it is that, um, you know, right now the Bitcoin futures market is very, very small. Um, I mean, it's around 20 billion dollars in open interest. Uh, for a trillion dollar asset, I mean, it's significant, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it's still it's still extremely tiny. Uh, but I kind of view it, um, maybe not so much the CME because it's a it's a cash settled, uh, I guess, like a paper settled product uh, that you can't use Bitcoin as collateral for. Uh, but in terms of like these, I guess, on chain settled, uh, you know, real UTXO settled uh, Bitcoin futures markets around the world, uh, Binance, FTX, Deribit, et cetera. I mean, essentially, I think you have a, a cost of capital in Bitcoin terms um, for, you know, it's it's like a, almost like a native interest rate and it's it's it fluctuates wildly uh, and and it's still very volatile. And, and and there's just a lot of speculation there. This this asset is nowhere near mature, but there is a cost of capital uh, for Bitcoin in USD terms. You know, if you want to sell your Bitcoin next March, you can do that and you can you know, you can get a 20 percent uh, annualized yield on that. And so I think as Bitcoin matures from a $1 trillion uh, asset to a $10 trillion asset, or, you know, as it continues to, you know, grow by a factor of two every, every year or two, uh, I think, I think this, this kind of physically settled futures market comes up against the the hundred, $200 trillion fixed income market. Uh, and there's, there's no way to centrally plan this. There's no way to centrally plan, uh, an on-chain settled, Bitcoin futures market. There's no way to centrally plan a, a Bitcoin spot market. Um, there are concerns uh, from, say, you know, the gold community that, hey, uh, this can get financialized. Paper markets can come in. They can suppress the price. But I think ultimately, the ability to settle uh, instantaneously uh, with with a Bitcoin UTXO on chain, you know, next block every ten minutes, uh, will will keep the market honest. And any kind of disparity between, say, a CME, which is 
which you can't use real Bitcoin, you can't withdraw real Bitcoin versus say, you know, a real uh, Bitcoin exchange, I think that will, will show up in, in the kind of in the market price. And so I'm not too worried about that. And I think the financialization of Bitcoin in this sense is extremely good and, and, and bullish for the long term outlook. Yeah, and I also see things like, you know, the perpetual futures, um, which is kind of it's it's a it was invented for Bitcoin, right? So this is something that the Bitcoin market figured out how to do. And the gold bug community or the gold community, the gold market could never have done the same thing because uh, it's not it's not a digital asset like Bitcoin is. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I, I think perpetual swaps are something that aren't aren't really uh, understood too well. And essentially, it's a it's a Bitcoin futures contract that never expires and that rolls over every eight hours. And so, uh, in order to kind of and you can and you can use uh, up to on some exchanges a hundred x leverage on you know long or short uh, and you're mark to market essentially every second. And so, right here, you have the funding rate and the, the funding rate essentially just is a way to kind of tie the price of this perpetual contract. Uh, a perpetual futures uh, contract to the to some sort of spot index. So right here, I have in this chart, uh, this is the funding rate. And at the top, you see it says 60.2% uh, APR. And so when Bitcoin broke its all-time high, you had a bunch of people, uh, institutions, whoever, traders come in and leverage long Bitcoin via perpetual swaps. And so, you know, when this funding rate hit 0.055%, uh, that, that's on an eight-hour period. And so annualized, that's a 60% yield. Yield. So what, essentially what you have is there was, there was this huge premium uh, to, or not premium, but there was this huge incentive to go short, uh, to go short Bitcoin on perpetual swaps. You had, you were getting paid out, uh, you know, five basis points of your notional position size uh, every, every eight hours. And so uh, if, if a trader wants to come in and just in a market neutral way, similar to kind of the, you know, the futures market, you can short perpetual swaps with just this tiny amount of your position and you can get paid a, you know, a pretty meaningful sum. And so this is, this funding rate is kind of a way to keep the price tethered to spot. Uh, but it's also a great way to kind of look at, you know, who's uh, offsides on the Bitcoin price, you know, what's, how much leverage is in the system, betting on the long or short side of things. Uh, and when this gets really overheated, like we kind of saw, like we saw in April and we saw a little bit, uh, you know, this month, uh, not, not in the same way, but, uh, you know, just starting to get up there, then I think that's when you kind of, got to see that the, the market's being driven by leverage and derivatives and, and not so much uh, spot buying. For sure. And I just see this as a such a unique thing that Bitcoin figured out. And the next thing that Bitcoin figures out, it's just going to, um, you know, stick it to the manipulators that much more. So every time the manipulators will come and try to control Bitcoin's price with futures or whatever the claim is of the gold bugs, um, something in the market will be created to make it even harder for them to do that. Yeah, that on. Um, I think another kind of interesting trend we see is that, um, so Bitcoin with these futures contracts um, and the ability to use leverage, yeah, you're not betting on, you're not betting on, well, you're betting directionally on the price of Bitcoin, but uh, you're, you're betting on a contract value of this, uh, whether it's perpetual swap or whether it's March 2020 futures or whatever it is. And so you have collateral uh, to enter that position. You need collateral. You need to be collateralized. And so um, traditionally, like when, say, Arthur Hayes from BitMEX invented the perpetual swap, all you could use was Bitcoin as collateral. Uh, there, was no, there was no fiat on ramps. And that was traditionally how every Bitcoin derivative, crypto derivative exchange works. Uh, you could trade all these pairs. You could do all these things, but you needed Bitcoin as your collateral. Um, but Bitcoin as collateral is actually kind of unfavorable for bulls. Uh, you're betting on the price of Bitcoin to go up with Bitcoin as your collateral. So if Bitcoin draws down, uh, your position draws down, but also your collateral value draws down and your liquidation price creeps up. Um, so there's like a convexity there that's not favorable. Um, so what we've actually seen since April, uh, when the market was really, really overheated with derivatives, and that was kind of probably the, it was the biggest driver of price. Uh, we've seen stable coins, uh, USD collateral, uh, take a larger and larger market share of derivatives. And so that's actually, um, that's bad news for the bears uh, in the sense that if the, you know, the, the Bitcoin derivatives market is now majority stable coins. Uh, and so if you want to short Bitcoin with stable coins, uh, you know, as the Bitcoin price runs up, you need more and more stable coins to, to collateralize. And it's, it's the opposite dynamic of longing with Bitcoin. And so 
uh, in this in you know in this sense there's going to be less the, the lower this metric goes there's going to be less long liquidations like we saw in april and may and and far more short squeezes which is which is good news for the bulls less volatility in general yep that on and so i think that's that's one of the biggest developments um, and it's something that's uh, aided by the cme right so here's uh, cme futures open interest it's their market share um, and so we saw in, in January, it was, you know, at this 16, 17% level. Uh, and, and now it's, you know, near its all time highs in terms of overall market interest. And it's actually uh, the, the leading open interest futures exchange uh, as of yesterday when I checked. And so this is a lot different from the last time we were at 60K when it was, I believe it was Bybit or, or a Bitcoin native uh, derivative exchange. So just in terms of, and then with CME, right, you need to be collateralized, you know, 40, 50%. So the max leverage, if you want to use leverage, is about 2x uh, compared to some of these other exchanges, which can you can use 100x. And so, and you can't use Bitcoin as collateral, right? So uh, they're all using treasuries or whatever, whatever, uh, you know, security they're using to, to long on CME. There's not that convexity there. The blow ups uh, when you have a CME market leading is is a lot is a lot different than when you have say a bitmex uh you know the those those the days of the bark candles uh with this kind of development are, are a lot less a uh, lot less likely i was also thinking the other day uh about the cme taking over more a higher percentage or a higher share is that going to affect weekend volatility you know like uh are we going to see no action really happen on the weekends it's all going to happen during trading hours of the etf and stuff I think it's interesting. Um, you know, the CME gap was something that we haven't heard about as much, but um, there was that was a pretty big, uh, pretty big meme. And honestly, I would I was trying back, you know, a year or two ago when there was a lot more noise around it to figure out if it was just a, a matter of variance or it was actually, uh, you know, there there were some whales that were trying to fill the gaps. Um, and it's interesting. I I think you know I'll be following that and you know. There's, you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, a hundred or what is it, a billion dollars of of uh, assets under management with with these ETFs and and like I think five billion of open interest on the CME is meaningful, um, and so I think there definitely will be some market impacts there, uh, and I guess we'll see what the you know the weekend price action looks like going forward. Yo, my fellow Bitcoin lovers, have I got something specifically curated for you? The Deep Dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium markets intelligence newsletter. This isn't some pay group selling buy and sell signals. No, this is a premium Bitcoin analysis led by Dylan LeClaire and his team of analysts. They break down in an easily digestible way what is happening on chain in the derivatives markets and in the greater macro backdrop context for Bitcoin. This newsletter turns volatility into a joke. So hit up members.bitcoinmagazine.com and use promo code podcast for 30% off the deep dive. That's members.bitcoinmagazine.com promo code podcast for 30% off. Divorce your pay group and learn why Bitcoin is the ultimate asset by Dylan and his team. My fellow plebs, the Bitcoin conference is back. Bitcoin 2022, April 6th through the 9th is the ultimate pilgrimage for the Bitcoin ecosystem. The Bitcoin conference is the biggest event in all of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We're leveling up and making this bigger and better than ever. I'm talking straight to the moon with the four day long festival in the heart of Miami at the Miami Beach Convention Center. This has something for everyone, whether you're a high-powered Bitcoin entrepreneur, a core developer, or a Bitcoin newbie, Bitcoin 2022 is the ultimate place for you to be with your people and celebrate and learn about the Bitcoin culture. So make sure to go to b.tc forward slash conference to lock in your official tickets and use promo code Satoshi for 10% off. Want more off? Pay in Bitcoin and you'll receive $100 off general admission and $1,000 off whale pass. Those are stackable. So go to b.tc forward slash conference and attend the best conference in Bitcoin history. Um, no, I mean, I was just going to ask, like, um, you know, in terms of Bitcoin being more than gold, I feel like, you know, talking about the perpetual swap, talking about the legitimization of this market, talking about um, stable coins uh being actually bullish um i feel like there's something there and i think a lot of people who are not bullish enough on bitcoin are people who like constantly um 
you know, find reasons to just say, oh, Bitcoin is just gold. Bitcoin is just that. It doesn't solve all of these other kind of value related problems. And I just feel like it's, it's worth kind of pointing out that no, like Bitcoin is a 10x, if not 100,000x improvement as a store of value tool and money from anything we've had in the in the past. And gold is just, you know, the previous best. Yeah, it's like global monetary asset that trades 24-7, 365 uh, in an absolutely free market. Um, you know, like the ability and, and it's still for, for, say, someone in the U.S., it might be sort of troublesome, but... Uh, the reality is like I can, you know, send Bitcoin to some exchange, you know, it settles in 10 minutes and I can draw down uh, from that collateral uh, at various, you know, loan to value ratios, uh, say an FTX, you can borrow, you can lend dollars or borrow dollars against Bitcoin at, at free market rates. And, and there's, it's not a fractional reserve system where they tell you what your rate is, it's what the market's willing to pay. Um, all these sort of things, like the financialization of it. Uh, are, are very healthy. And I think that's uh, where a lot of disruption is going to come. Most people don't really understand the second and third order effects of this, you know, free market monetary asset, you know, monetizing in, in real time. Dylan, you had some great stuff on the mining sector. Do you want to jump to there? Because we have about, uh, I have a hard stop coming up here. So, um, but this, this mining, I, I wish I was more highly informed, but there's so much going on in Bitcoin uh, that this is one of those areas that I probably look at the least, but it's one of the most important. So can you fill us in here? Yeah, of course. So um, a lot of the, our mining research in this report was conducted by, by Sam Rule. Um, so uh, check, check Sam out. He does great work. He, we uh, work on the deep dive together uh, if, you, if you don't know who he is. But yeah, I mean, so basically the story of 2021 in the mining industry was the China ban, uh, the massive drawdown in hash rate, all of that you know, kind of relocation uh, that had to occur almost instantaneously for these operations. Uh, we saw hash rate decline by more than 50% in a rapid fashion. Uh, we had multiple difficulty adjustments in a row. Uh, essentially, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a mechanism to, to make it profitable uh, for, for miners if, if they turn off their rigs or to make it increasingly hard to mine as more and more, uh, as it becomes more and more profitable, that's the difficulty adjustment. Um, so here's the difficulty. Um, and we've seen, you know, over the last three months, we've seen that that increase by almost 60%. Uh, and just, you know, look at, look at all those positive difficulty adjustments in a row. Um, that's, you know, it, that means it's getting more competitive for these miners. But um, I think another kind of metric I really like to look at is, is the hash is the hash price. Um, so this is minor revenue per peta hash. Um, some people like to use per X hash. Some people like to use uh, other denominations. But essentially, this just kind of tells you on a per hash basis, how profitable are these miners? Uh, and what we kind of see is that compared to uh, say, you know, the same time in, in 2020, uh, miners were like four X more profitable than they were on a per hash basis. So, uh, you know, any ASIC that's essentially plugged in is, is you know, churning out money, printing money, maybe printing, printing is the wrong word, but uh, it's extremely profitable for all these rigs. And, and the reality is most Bitcoin miners don't want to sell uh, at all or, or try to sell as little as possible so the more the hash price goes up uh you know the minor revenue per hash that they're getting in dollar terms uh then you know the less they have to sell and so this is kind of another one of those bullish dynamics that we see uh and i think that hash price this this metric will actually over the course of 2022 probably continue to increase um there's just a really big supply demand imbalance with with asics with plugging them in with with finding rack space um, and so, you know, it's going to be super, super lucrative to be a Bitcoin miner uh, for the next year, 18 months. I mean, it is right now, uh, but eventually, you know, that that economic incentive to mine Bitcoin, to plug to plug these machines in, to, you know, to create more ASICs, uh, it, it's very strong. And that difficulty will ratchet up, uh, you know, we'll have another halving. Um, and so eventually, you know, I think this this uh, this metric is going to it's in a secular downtrend. And if I had that this entire chart, it, it would look like basically just flatlined. If you look at it in logarithmic view, it's down into the, into the right. Uh, but you know, this, we've had kind of this trend, trend shift since 2020, which for anyone that's mining, you know, has been super lucrative. Yeah. My follow on here is uh, Sam talked a little bit last week or when the last time he was on, was that last week already? Um, it was that, last week, Ansel. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, that the miners might be taking some, instead of selling it on the open market, right. They are taking it, and creating 
collateralized products with it. Um, can you, you know, explain that for the audience and for me? <laughs> yeah. So essentially, you know, kind of linking back to what we were just talking about, it's, you know, the financialization of Bitcoin is, is a net benefit. Whereas, you know, in the early days you had Bitcoin miners that would plug in and they had to just market sell any Bitcoin uh, that they, that they did mine at any price to cover, you know, their electrical expenses to cover, you know, OPEX, CAPEX, all of it. Uh, but today you have, you know, companies like Marathon, companies like HUT. Uh, Marathon actually is partnered with Silvergate, uh, which is a California bank that's a Fed member bank. Uh, and they, they have a $100 million Bitcoin collateralized credit line. So they give the banks some, some of their Bitcoin to custody. The bank gives them a, a dollar liquidity or a dollar credit line that they can pull from at any time. Uh, and, you know, these, these rates are, are really low. It's, I don't know if, if for Marathon, uh, I don't know. Uh, what their rate is, but you know, three, four, five percent uh, a Bitcoin, an over over collateralized Bitcoin loan is is there's no credit risk for the bank because they can liquidate uh, at any time or if Bitcoin draws down. So um, you know, this is just an, a kind of another development in the financialization of Bitcoin, where you know there's no credit risk for the banks. The Bitcoin miners don't have to sell, and you're paying say three three percent, four percent, five percent, even ten percent interest, which is which is really high. Um, especially for, you know, globally liquid collateral, um, you know, and you don't have to sell a, an asset that's appreciating at 100% a year or 200% a year. And so, you know, this is just kind of another one of these dynamics where as Bitcoin matures, um, you know, it becomes more institutionalized. Uh, these miners have access to public capital markets. Um, you know, some people may not like it, but, you know, for the, for the price, for the adoption of Bitcoin, it was always going to happen. And it's actually, uh, you know, one of these shifts that's really, really bullish. Okay, I see. I, I was confused. I thought it was something other than just, uh, you know, collateralized loans with your Bitcoin. Um, yeah, and this this speaks to what Christian, you were saying earlier about Rizzo and his, uh, you know, when it, will holders sell? Well, holders don't have to sell anymore, right? They can That's true. That. That, that, that is a new dynamic. I want to stick on the kind of minor talk again for like two minutes and then we can wrap it up because I know Ansel got to, needs to run, but um, Will Bitcoin mining like come to a head with the supply chain issues? Because like you know the 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 profitability theoretically on existing hash rate might balloon, and there might be not be any way to like service demand to put more hash rate on um, in an efficient way, given what's kind of happen happening geopolitically. Um, have you kind of thought about this dynamic and like? You know, typically this happens during bull runs, but it's like, you know, lots of people make huge orders at the top and, you know, those orders are fulfilled, but I, I feel like it's not going to be that easy this time. Yeah, I think, I think that's kind of, you know, to an extent, that's what's already playing out. We've seen, you know, prices, you know, 5X since 2020 and, and hash rate just hasn't been able to keep up um, the supply chain kind of destruction uh, around the world. The semiconductor shortage is just playing one small part and Bitcoin miners are definitely not at the top of the list for these, for these uh, semiconductor chips uh, and, you know, the, the lists on these, on these foundries. And so I think that's, you know, that's what we're going to see play out. There's obviously as Bitcoin continues to pump the, the value of these ASICs, the economic incentive to, to produce more of them will increase, but I think there's definitely a lag time and, and you also have to plug these things in. Um, there's a lot of ASICs just from talking anecdotally with some miners. They're like, Hey, yeah, I mean, we got, we got some old machines that we'd love to plug in. We just don't have rack space. Um, and so this is, you know, and this is a kind of, it, it, it was coupled with the supply chain disruption and then kicking all these Bitcoin miners out of China. Uh, you know, there's all these, all these miners looking for excess energy and it's out there. Uh, it just takes a while to, to get plugged in efficiently. You know, it's still, it's still quite small. I mean, Bitcoin mining as a as an industry, right? I think it produces about fifty or sixty million dollars a day at, at this point. So it's significant, um, but you know, compared to compared to what the size used to be, but it's still really really small. Um, and I think you know it eventually will be somewhat commoditized. But uh, you know, during this bull market, that I think this this minor revenue per hash blows out in a, in a big big way. I think you're going to have a lot of miners come in late, uh, purchase a lot of really expensive machines uh, with, you know, somewhat expensive power sources and, and lever up. And there'll probably be some sort of liquidation event, uh, you know, where, where these guys all get wiped out. And I think that's just kind of natural. Um, but yeah, I think for the meantime, if you're, if you're plugged in, you're very happy. Uh, and especially, you know, these, these minor valuations, 
I think all these miners were up 13, 14% just today alone. So, uh, you know, they're all levered on their balance sheets. Um, and so I think, you know, in the, in the time being, there's a, there's a good chance that they may actually outperform Bitcoin. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not buy miners, just buy some spot. <laughs> well, the price has to drop a, a, by what to make them not profitable. So I don't know if that era of Bitcoin is over. It, it, are we going to see a price drop that would get down low enough to say that, you know, $6,000 Bitcoin uh, is not profitable? Yeah, I think that's where the, the difficulty uh, uh, kind of adjustment comes in, where uh, you're going to see with, with, with all this hash rate that comes online over the next five years, I mean, hash rate will increase by probably... I mean, I don't even know. Hash rate will eventually increase by an order of magnitude, just with Moore's law, with more more miners uh, being produced, um, and you'll see that difficulty just rack up. And I kind of think of that as like a production cost of Bitcoin, just continuing to ratchet up. Uh, the production cost of a sat of a satoshi will pump forever. Um, and so I think if the price you know got chopped in half tomorrow, a lot of these miners would unplug uh, because it's just not profitable, and you'd see difficulty just kind of downwards adjust. Um, you know, some there's, I know for a fact, there are some miners with no cost of electricity. So they're just, you know, they're mining at any price, but uh, that's not true for everybody. Uh, but I think that's just one of the beauties of Bitcoin, you know, um, right now it's, it's super lucrative. Uh, if price got cut in half, it wouldn't be as lucrative, but, you know, difficulty would downwards adjust and increase that incentive. And, you know, it's just, it's one of the most, I think it's one of the most beautiful mechanisms in the world, the difficulty adjustment and, and, you know, the, the Bitcoin network. Dylan, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing these insights with our audience. Um, where can people learn more about you and remind people what you're working on again? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Dylan McClare underscore um, doing the deep dive at, at Bitcoin Magazine. It's our you know financial product uh, where we talk about on-chain analytics, derivative markets, mining, macro. Um, just joined the UTXO team. Uh, so that's super exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really appreciate you guys having me on. This was a, this was a fun rip. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, to the listeners, we're going to have Dylan or Sam on every single month to go over their monthly report and kind of dive into what is happening on chain, what's happening in broader macro, uh, and keep you all informed of what's happening in Bitcoin and in the world, because Bitcoin is just this thing that is, you know, so pivotal in the world these days. And this is the best show to keep you abreast of all of that. So uh, thanks so much for listening. You can follow me at CK underscore Snarks. You can follow Ansel at Ansel Lindner. Make sure to share the show. Make sure to subscribe to the Deep Dive. Dylan is now offering a free version of the Deep Dive too. So check that out. You can get a lot of this stuff, including the monthly report eventually on that free edition. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the very least you can do. And it's some of the best information in the space, in my opinion. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. All right. Peace.